certainly start with some of our uh, email questions, because I've gotten a few of those. Um, Dr. Carlson, I, we got a couple of questions um, from our colleagues in the Kobe Sawyer Athletic Training Program. Their students had a couple of questions regarding concussions, and I'm going to uh, lump them a little bit. Uh, one was, how much do you have to hurt, or how bad do your symptoms have to be for you to have a concussion? Um, and the second being, is there any role for chiropractic treatment in recovering from a concussion? Okay, so I'll start with the second one. The, um, chiropractic, um, and I, I had the benefit during the last talk of reading the actual question. Um, uh, chiropractic for the neck, specifically, not chiropractic for any for sort of general. Uh, and I think the answer is, um, if the last thing left is the neck, then possibly yes, chiropractor would be useful person to help you with that. The issue that I'd have with doing chiropractic care sooner would be some of the manipulations that they do, similar to, we had one of the coaches at the college want injured athletes to start a yoga program, uh, which is nice, but if it threatens your balance, i.e. gets your head sort of moving around. If they're adjusting the neck and they're moving the head quickly, that could threaten your balance. So I'd say it depends. Um, the first question was, how do you know if you have a concussion, basically? How many symptoms do you have to have? Yeah. Let, me, let me read verbatim so I can um, address that. <laughs> how severe are the symptoms of individuals who just take a fall without hitting their head? versus an actual blow to the head, and could an actual blow, um, or excuse me, could, could a concussion with, without an actual blow take longer to see or to recognize? I think the reason that they take longer to recognize if there wasn't a blow to the head is because you don't remember a blow to the head. And I think that's one of the, one of the key things is, is in recognition of a concussion is you, if you hit your head, you're thinking, oh, I hit my head. I might have a concussion. If you didn't hit your head, there may not be recognition of, of that. And I don't know that there's a, a limit. We, we grade concussion symptoms. I, I listed all the concussion symptoms there for you. We grade each of those symptoms. You have a patient rate it from zero to six. And it's, it's, do you have headache? Zero to six. Do you have nausea? Zero to six. You know, and you go through this list. And even if they say one on headache, which I've seen in the last couple of weeks, and they had a mechanism of injury, I have to consider other concussions. So I think you could have minimal symptoms and a mechanism of injury, and we have to say, you know, this probably is a concussion. Uh, from what you said, <clears throat> yep, you're on. Yeah, what you said um, about helmets, uh, it seems to me that helmets, correct me if I'm wrong, helmets don't improve if you have a whiplash injury. So you hit your shoulder and your head just, they do, they primarily help with direct contact with the head, is that correct? That's correct. So a helmet is not going to keep you from getting a concussion. The helmet is to prevent you from getting something more serious. So the, one of the myths on helmets is that there is a concussion helmet out there that's going to fix all concussions and going to protect you from all concussions. And if you're really thinking about the sloshing around of the brain inside the skull, there's no helmet that's going to keep your brain from moving inside the skull. So you're really trying to convert that more serious injury to a concussion. That's really the goal of the helmet. Um, and if somebody's trying to sell you a helmet that's going to prevent concussion, you need to ask a lot of questions and probably look somewhere else. Wonderful. We have one more back here. Hi. Concussions are a hot topic, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I work, work in a school system, and I'm wondering how we can educate parents and teaching staff about the return to learn. I've been in the school system for 15 years, and I've never seen anything like it in the last couple of years, frankly. Um, a number of students who have numerous, four or five concussions, um, some of whom have had symptoms for many months um, into last year. And when you mentioned the, the number of um, points and, and things in terms of emotional, for instance, the migraines are emotional, I'm seeing the emotional stuff. Uh, and that's pretty scary. And it scares kids, it scares parents. So I took as many of these as I could find on the table. I'll spill some more. But I really wonder, how do I help the staff to know? How do I help parents? Um, so, the return to play is one thing. Return to learn is something else. Yeah, like return to learn is really, is really key. One of, uh, one of our key people who helps us with that is sitting right behind you. 
Molly does outreach to local school districts, awesome. and um, you can sign up and, and uh, ask to have Molly and Sama Susanna, correct? Yes. Visit your school to talk about concussion, do some education. So your host this evening. So uh, <laughs> um, that's one of the ways we're trying to outreach. Um, that little YouTube video is amazing in terms of its its use, usefulness. I think to just make people aware of what in the world are we talking about. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of need for concussion awareness. I will say the reason I'm standing here today is because we are more aware of concussion. So, you know, 10 years ago, we weren't talking about concussion like we do now. Okay. So that's good. So there has been more awareness. Does awareness breed more disinformation? Maybe it does. Thank you. Perfect. And yes, for those of you um, listening at home who, who may be affiliated with a school or sports organization and you want more information or, or more targeted information to your specific needs regarding anything that we've covered tonight, um, please definitely email us at sports at hitchcock.org and we'd be happy to discuss um, the ways that we can we can help your school or your organization. We had a couple of hands here in the back. So this question is regarding injury prevention and I know you're talking about um, preventing injuries and strength training being one of the most beneficial ways to do that. And I was curious if you could just distinguish between stretching in terms of static stretching and dynamic stretching. Sure. Uh, so static stretching would just be an elongation of the muscle, right? So passively. But dynamic stretching has an elongation of the muscle, but the muscle is also more likely contracting as well. So there is a contractile element to the stretch, and that adds muscle fibers in a lengthening fashion too, so the muscle actually gets a little bit stronger with dynamic stretching. So there has been some evidence, um, these things are a little limited in their studies, right? but uh, there has been some evidence for sprinting and dynamic stretching before so, and a less, uh, uh, less strains, right? hamstring strains, especially in soccer as well. Um, there's been less evidence for, for static stretching. The one thing I would point to with static stretching and injury prevention would be dancing. There is some evidence that if you stretch before you meet extreme ranges of motion, large ranges of motion, you're less likely to get a stretch-induced muscle strain. But that's a very, very specific thing to a very specific group of people. So if you don't need to bring your foot up to your head, right, there's probably no value to you. But dynamic stretching is, is not only a stretching activity, but it's also a, a somewhat of a strengthening kind of warm-up activity as well. Awesome. Great questions. Thank you so much. We had a couple of more hands in the back. I believe yours was first, sir. Is there any evidence that neck braces in conjunction with a uh, full face on or closed face on or mouth guards reduce the incidence of brain injury? Um, and talk about mouth guards first. There was a there was a whole movement in, in the dentist, the sports dentist, that this special mouth guard that they only and only they can make for you was going to prevent concussion. The idea being, if you had this cushioning mouth guard, that sort of force wouldn't get transmitted up to your brain. And it just like the helmets, special helmets, that's sort of gone by the wayside. It sort of lived its life, and it, and people moved on from from that. So mouth guards, no. Um, neck guards, again, I think, you know, if you're thinking about the cowboy collar in football, you're thinking something like that, you really, again, you're looking at not preventing the concussion, you're really, really looking at preventing another injury, another more serious injury, i.e. breaking your neck. So uh, one could envision that if you made the neck more rigid, that then the brain might see even more of a sloshing because the neck isn't, you're not, straight, you know, so you're not able to use the strength of your neck to prevent that. So I don't think there's any neck thing, uh, you know, the worst case of a neck brace is I had a patient when I was a resident who had what's called ankylosing spondylitis. His entire spine had spontaneously fused. And he got a concussion when he fell backwards because he couldn't absorb the shock and falling like the rest of us can. So I think there's a, there's a point at which too rigid is, is not a good thing. Wonderful. Another, uh, we have another question here in the back. 
Okay, my doctor, my question is for Dr. Ko, I believe. Um, I'm wondering if you have a, a simple test that we can do in the field for um, diag well, maybe not diagnosis, but um, a partial or even complete ACL tear. And if you do, if you could show us what that might look like. Yeah, so um, I, I don't right now treat that many ACL tears, but um, actually right after right after an injury happens, one of the best times to, an ACL injury happens, one of the best times to uh, catch it because once the effusion happens, it's really hard to, uh, once it fills up with blood uh, from the tear, it's really hard to, to examine. Um, there are a couple, there are a couple different Tests, you know, they, they are most of them are variations on grabbing the femur and grabbing the tibia and shucking them uh, forward on each other and comparing side to side. Uh, you know, if the moral of the story is if you hurt your knee uh, and it swells up quickly uh, and it's painful to walk on, something's wrong and uh, it deserves going to to uh, to be seen. Uh, and so, you know, the ins and outs probably of what exactly is torn are, are probably more important for the later time. But, but pain, inability to wear, bear weight, swelling, are, those are your, your hallmarks for something wrong. And actually, probably Molly, Molly deals with that on the sidelines more than, than any of us and might be able to speak to it as well. Well, I, I will say um, I have the benefit of a couple of degrees and, and a lot of training that kind of helped me to get there. Um, but Dr. Ko is absolutely right. The, if you have a big effusion, big swelling, pain where you can't weight bear or it's very difficult to weight bear, um, the immediate treatment for that is going to be the same across the board. So, so whether or not you're, if, if you're, if you're a healthcare provider who isn't often in the on the field setting or, or in the sports setting, um, or if you're uh, a lay person or a coach who's who's trying to help determine an injury, um, the immediate you know first couple of days or even the first week it, it's not really going to change, um, and it's determining what exact structure is injured at that point is, is not as important as, as getting them off of it, um, ice and, and elevation and all of those things. Dr. Carlson brings up a good point, which is, you know, <clears throat> you can think that, that you have a, an ACL rupture, which is, you know, soft tissue injury, the stability, the bone structure of the knee is intact, and you could have a tibial plateau fracture, which you don't necessarily want to fork around and, and see if something's, uh, if something's moving. So. The tests are, I'm happy, I'm happy to demonstrate the test later. <laughs> Great. Is there any other? Oh, I'm just going to hit folks who uh, have not asked a question yet. But we've got a few minutes still, so I think, I think we can make it. Hi, I actually have two questions about concussions. The first question is regarding um, being a youth coach. And is there any test that if you were on the bench that you can give to a kid who's rung a bell or her bell? Um, you know, I've heard different things. You can look at their pupils. If you have a, you know, you ask them in the beginning of the season, how quickly can you say the outfit forward and backward? And then you, they ring their bell and then you test them again. Um, beyond baseline testing and having that, you know, um, preseason base to go by. So that's my first question, if there's anything that you can say on the bench. Um, and then the second question I have is I've worked with a lot of high school athletes, um, and there have been a handful that have had multiple concussions. And I'm wondering if there's any studies that have been done on um, multiple concussions and um, the connection with mental health, <coughs> and if they're, um, because some of the symptoms can be similar. So I'm just curious because um, I, I just have some questions regarding that, that those similarities. And so the first question on immediate recognition of concussion, I think the answer is the not right test. Uh, basically, you know, if you're, if you're the coach, you should know these kids. Now, if this kid isn't, isn't acting right, he, she's not right, they fail the not right test. Um, and I think that's, that's just, that's, it's sort of a gut reaction to say, no, that, that's not right. That was a hard hit. I'm going to sit this person out for a couple of shifts, and then you ask them a simple question, and they go, oh, I don't know. 
um, they, they failed to not write tests. So there isn't really a specific one test. There's um, a commercial product that's trying to be marketed right now called King Devic, and it's basically following reading numbers off of a card, and the numbers get not lined up as easy and fewer and far farther between, but you're supposed to go <coughs> excuse me, across the lines. And of course, they're trying to sell a product, and it's still sort of not quite ready for prime time, and you'd have to buy it. Second question, the emotional sequelae of concussion, I think is, <coughs> is really difficult. I don't know that I have the answer, but with certainty, there are people who have had enough head injuries um, who have a personality change. And there are people who've had a more severe non-concussion head injury who have a personality change. So yeah, you're definitely changing the brain in some <coughs> sort of significant ways if you haven't recovered from concussion. And I don't have an easy answer for that, but there definitely is some emotional stuff. And some of it is tied up and it gets complicated because <clears throat> it's tied up in all the emotions of having a concussion, being taken out of your usual activities, being withdrawn from, you can't be on this team, you can't even travel with the team because you get, see, you know, you get nauseous on the bus or you didn't go to school today so you can't travel with your team. So you can, <clears throat> excuse me, fold in a whole lot of other emotional stuff that may be concussion related but not directly concussion. We have a question from the internet. <coughs> so sure. have a question from the internet? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. After a blow to the side of the head or an unexpected fall onto a rock, is there any particular significance to having a black eye a couple of days later? And <coughs> if this person ignored all concussion systems that lasted about six weeks, is there any reason to seek medical care now if there are no obvious symptoms? <coughs> Okay, so black eye is just because of injury to the skin and the scalp, so not necessarily. I mean, you could have a black eye and have no concussion. Um, it depends on where you hit your head. So six weeks of symptoms is really of concern if the symptoms aren't gone. That person should definitely take care of this. There is actually a person here, Dartmouth Hitchcock, who deals with a, she's part of the Department of Surgery. She deals with a longer standing traumatic brain injuries than I deal with. I like to keep the sports concussion program to less than six weeks, but there is someone, I can provide that name if needed, who does the longer drawn out uh, traumatic brain injuries. This would include the car accident with a very serious brain injury, but that person, if they're not right, they're still not right and they need to be checked out. And we have hit the witching hour. It is now eight o'clock. Um, so if you, quickly before before we leave, I wanted to thank again all of our speakers for being here. I know there's a lot of questions on uh, concussion here tonight, and I know we have a lot of coaches in the audience. Um, quick reminder from a legal perspective, because we live in that kind of world today, um, in the states of both Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, it is, you are legally bound, if you suspect a cut concussion, to remove that student athlete or that athlete from play at that time um, and they are not allowed to return the same day. Um, feigning now with, with media being what it is and with the amount of information that is out there, uh, feigning ignorance in, in a court of law while being a coach um, is not going to cut it anymore. So uh, we, and we have lots of resources regarding everything that you heard about tonight, um, from traumatic injury to strength and conditioning um, and injury prevention, as well as concussion. Um, again, that email address, if you're interested in any of those resources, is sports, with an S at the end, at hitchcock.org. I want to thank all of our speakers again for being with us, and all of you in attendance in the horrible weather, and uh, all of our viewers at home as well.